Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So welcome back to the track. Uh, we have a great presentation for you. Um, we have uh, Tim over here who's going to lead a panel with a number of uh, customers. Pretty interesting perspective there. If you weren't here this morning, uh, a few things I'd like to share with you. We have uh, the HP uh, sponsored community lounge. It's over back that way. If you haven't made it out there yet today, I highly recommend that you do. We have some great hoodies with uh, iron on badges, which is so you can customize them. Pretty cool. I also highly recommend that you RSVP for our party on Tuesday evening. It's going to be a great time and it's going to run out of space very soon. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Tim. Thanks, Tim. Thanks Cody. Uh, well, welcome. Welcome to OpenStack and uh, to the sessions here uh, with uh, Hewlett Packard. Um, I'm uh, with Hewlett Packard. I'm in the product management team, and uh, I have the uh, honor of working with many of our customers. Uh, I run a program uh, that talks to customers on a regular basis uh, for our uh, get customer requirements. Uh, so for today, uh, we brought together four uh, of our customers. Um, I'll start on the side over there. We have Steve Duft uh, with HPIT. And I know it's not fair because he's Hewlett Packard, but if you've ever seen the uh, inside of HP's uh, IT group, they're a customer. They're one of our best customers. They're one of our biggest customers. So Steve and I have a great relationship that he's a customer to me, and so he's on stage for us uh, today with that. Uh, we have Orlando Bader, uh, who is the CEO and founder of Ormuco. Um, uh, and uh, he, he, they've been running OpenStack for quite some time. Uh, we've got Devin Bleak uh, with Fox Entertainment. Um, and uh, we've got Scotty Miller. Uh, who's here from DreamWorks. So we got a couple on the end here uh, representing the entertainment industry. So um, what I'd like to do is, is have them each tell you a little bit about what they're doing with OpenStack today in their companies. So every one of these guys here uh, is working with OpenStack today, some in production, some in, uh, in development and test. And I'll start with uh, Scotty. I'll have you start off with DreamWorks, kind of what, how you're using OpenStack today. Sure. Hello, everybody. Uh, our, our use of OpenStack started probably in 2002 before cloud was cool. Back then it was called utility computing or grid computing and it was a way to share infrastructure as a service resources that HP had in their Palo Alto data center that we were using in our Redwood Shores facility. Uh, from that relationship we moved forward to, to using HP's public cloud for object storage, using the cloud primarily as a way to store cold data but also using what I call cloud as transport. You put the data in one side and it pops out the other side and someone else's network transits your stuff around the globe. Pretty, pretty handy. Uh, we've been doing OpenStack itself um, in a dev test environment for a little over a year and a half now, and we're just about to receive our second OpenStack cluster. We're going to be a customer shipment number one of the HP Helion Rack product, which will be kind of cool. It's a control plane in a box with enough uh, storage and compute to be useful. And we're going to use that as our dev test and early prototype for some outward-facing uh, image generation media delivery services pro projects that we're working on, as well as re-hosting our internal cloud to be OpenStack instead of the human middleware-driven telephone and ticketing system cloud we have today. Great. Thank you. Devin? I think you're mic'd, you're mic'd up. Oh. Um, so we've been uh, looking at OpenStack primarily along two kind of tracks. Uh, the first is as repatriation from some of the public clouds. Um, of some of our applications, and the other is to help enable more agility for some of our development groups internally in the enterprise. Okay, great. Perfect. So, for those here that are not familiarized with Ormuco, we're a service provider, telecommunication uh, managed across the globe. So, basically, we decide to use OpenStack as um, of the top 10 video game companies, five of them are currently our customers, and we have to host their games, which have around 720 physical servers that we have to host, whether in the Americas or EMEA. And we decide to build a next generation cloud, and we use OpenStack for it. So we decide to use an open standard that allows us to deliver the next generation cloud to run applications that existing public cloud providers were not able to provide. Thanks. And Steve, uh, you're required to use HP Helion OpenStack, is that correct? <laughs> well, <laughs> technically, no. But, um, and it, so we, we have been using OpenStack for a number of years. Obviously, HP has their public cloud, and we've been running applications in that space for, uh, for, for quite, quite some time. We also, um, about two years ago, decided that we had a need for an object storage solution. Um, you know, 
and we had what was there in the public cloud, but we also had some use cases where we wanted it behind our firewall that we could use it for um, more, more traditional applications, but having that class of storage that we don't have today. So we, just, we deployed a, a Swift stack based uh, OpenStack object store. Um, and you know, since then, we've been moving toward what was originally Cloud OS from HP, and now the, the Helion product, looking at um, the, the full in infrastructure as a service suite, the, the development platform as well, um, really to, to provide um, a, a platform for, for application transformation, for, to allow our, our app teams to develop in more cloud-native form, but run on our internal infrastructure. Great, thanks. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on you, Devin, first. Uh, uh, so I know that uh, you guys at Fox uh, Entertainment, so you've got all these movies that come out. Um, so you have all these third parties that build applications or websites to promote these movies. And you, as your cloud, is providing a service to them. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, so we basically built a platform within the cloud to host all of these third party built applications. So when you take a look, when you look at OpenStack, uh, that being an OpenStack cloud, what are the challenges in having that many clients coming in to your data center and, and providing either applications or? Uh, so for us, you know, the cloud is all about agility of the infrastructure layer. Um, we don't know what our marketing groups want to do with their next campaign. Um, so we can't really, you know, say buy, go buy a whole bunch of hardware for it. Um, Additionally, we don't know when that campaign launches how much traffic it's going to get or how it's going to perform on the servers themselves. So being able to scale up compute and storage kind of at a moment's notice as well as you know, scale it back down when we don't need it again, that's really what we're looking for. Okay. And you guys are, are th that, that you're running today on OpenStack? Uh, we're not running that workload on OpenStack. We're looking at a money map. So you're moving an existing workload to that, looking to yeah. move it to an OpenStack cloud. Okay, great. Um, Orlando. Uh, as a service provider, um, you have extra challenges with many clients um, that would be coming into your cloud. And uh, I know we talked a little bit earlier, and uh, Jonathan talked this morning about yeah. federation. Uh, I, I hear you're doing something around federation with your cloud today, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So basically, um, this is my advice for everyone here that is trying to build an OpenStack cloud that require more than 100 nodes. Uh, there is many challenges companies have nowadays. That they want to become um, service provider within the organizations. And one of the major challenges they have when they build up in a stack is they cannot scale it to the limit they require to run their business. So if you're planning to build it, you should be looking at a federated cloud. So what this means is if you want to have more than 100 nodes, you don't want to modify the open stack code. You don't want to go out of the standard. You want to make sure that you can put 10 members, which is basically 10 OpenStack installation of 100 nodes to be able to go to 1,000 nodes, being able to manage it. But it's not only to have a single sign-in, it's just the ability to avoid all the performance that you actually have by running one single OpenStack installation for your organization. Okay, and so you, 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 you um, went after Federation and you have Federation working today as well. Yeah, correct? correct, so we actually made it work. Um, it was a big challenge to make it work before with Juno. Like I can tell you, it was almost impossible actually without modifying the code. Uh, I don't suggest go that road. If you go with Kilo, uh, we spent around 24 months of R&D to actually build a federated cloud, around 31 uh, employees, uh, multi-million dollar project. Uh, with Kilo, it was actually easier. It was not like they say, it's already done. It's, it's not production ready yet. You need to actually look at SAML and find a way to incorporate it in your code because it's, it's already built in Keystone, but it's not going to work the way you want it. And don't try to adapt, um, not, don't try to change um, OpenStack itself. Like adapt your code to work with OpenStack because if you change it, you, you're not going to have support for maintenance releases and patches. And we have been running in production. So just my advice for anybody here is just keep it as simple as possible and don't try to uh, overcomplicate it, right? Great, thank you, thank you. Now, Steve, um, HP today, the one HP, uh, will be two HP in a little while, but the one HP right now has over <laughs> 300,000 employees, is that correct? <coughs> Yeah, I think somewhere on there. High, high 200. So, yeah, yeah. so you, you definitely have to deal with scale issues. 
uh, when it comes to the cloud. So what are some of the challenges that you've had um, in, with OpenStack on dealing with the scale issues internally? Well, so, I mean, it's, it's always the same challenge. I mean, the, you know, the reference that, um, um, you know, that uh, Orlando was making to uh, scalability limit limitations of 100 nodes and whatnot, those, those always exist. Our, we have an existing private cloud that runs on HP Cloud Service Automation and a VMware backend that we built over the last two or three years, and that's running somewhere around 36,000 VMs and 1,700 applications. Um, it's it's difficult to do that in in environments where where you're you're constrained. And so, to his point, building building federated um, buckets to be able to run your applications within is a is a much cleaner model rather than trying to force scale out of out of the entire environment. Yeah. So his point is actually right. So, for example, limitations. If you're here, it's because you're interested in OpenStack. Um, if you're trying to build Neutron, you know it's one of the weakest thing that exists right now. So don't try to make it, you know, like high available, modify the code. Just, just use hardware to actually connect to uh, Neutron and make it work. That was the only way we actually were able to make it successful. The same with the storage. If you can only go to one petabyte, use federated environment to go to 10 times that, right? Yeah, Scotty, you're nodding your head. We had a little discussion earlier <laughs> on networking. So tell us a little bit of DreamWorks' challenges in the networking space and how you attack that. So the, the biggest issues in the networking space for us is, and it goes back to one of the social engineering challenges, convincing developers and software architects to run in a cloud architecture. This whole concept of cloud ready has been a little bit of a challenge. And what I mean by that is most developers are used to very resilient, highly re available physical infrastructure in which they run their applications so they can be a little bit sloppy. In a cloud environment, it's more dynamic. VMs can disappear, hypervisors can disappear, things can disappear, and the application has to provide the resiliency. So design applications to be cloud ready means the applications are restartable, they're recoverable. So we ran headlong into the need for res uh, resilient infrastructure with the single points of failure that are in Neutron. Uh, DVS has some challenges. There's other issues we had with interaction with our routers, where Neutron has been probably the problem for everything we've tried to do in the last six months. So uh, again, to what Orlando said, the recommendation from some of the cloud architects is to do networking redundancy in physical infrastructure and then maybe even look at using VLANs for your network subdivision instead of relying on Neutron today. It'll get better, uh, and there'll be a transition time in the future. But right now, I wouldn't class Neutron as production ready. Yeah, correct. So don't, don't try to use, um, if you're not running it from the hardware, don't try to use VLANs as a software because it's going to be very slow. Uh, just try to use GRE tunnels. Just anybody trying to do that, just go that route. It will save a three to six months of research why it doesn't work improperly. <laughs> so it's one of the things. So, and we talked a little bit about that earlier. How do, how do you work with the community here? In other words, how do you get that message back to the OpenStack community so that the upstream stuff does get the message? So well, that's, that's a challenge right now, right? So it's, um, if you look at what's speaking to um, Scotty, it's not like Linux that you have one person that made the decision. So there's many different leaders that actually make the decision of how things should go. So uh, to transfer that knowledge to the community is actually a challenge because we actually have the knowledge to transfer it, but by the time that it goes to upstream, um, it takes too long for our engineers to actually transfer that knowledge. So we're not doing it the way we would like to do it in the future. So hopefully that process actually get better so that we can contribute more to the community. Great, and, and I'll answer that a bit too. Uh, at HP, um, one of my jobs is to work with customers and, and we have a lot of efforts upstream as well as uh, inside building our own distribution and one of my main responsibilities is to get these customer requirements and move them back both upstream and uh, within the product itself. Uh, so HP tries to contribute uh, evenly on both of those fronts uh, and in many cases it's more important that the fix be made upstream instead of, uh, you know, forking off any sort of changes to the... Yeah, that's one of the challenges to work in uh, what we chose uh, HP Healy and OpenStack is the ability that you have resources you can talk to and they can help you with this process. So if you have important application for your organization, you can transfer the knowledge to them and they can deal with all the politics and make sure that is, as they grow with the community to the new releases of OpenStack, they actually is compatible with the application and code you have. Okay, great. Um, so Devin, you have a lot of external and I suspect internal clients for your cloud. Um, what are some of the biggest requests that you get from your internal clients that the OpenStack technology is going to allow you to deliver? 
Well, I would say we're really kind of in the same spot as Scotty is um, with getting developers into the mindset of building these kind of cloud native, cloud ready applications. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so, yeah, we're actually putting on a hackathon on uh, Helion <laughs> next month to try and, you know, kick, kick start that a bit. Okay, and so how are you doing that? How are you organizing that internally? You're, you're looking to get internal people up to speed on the technology. Right. So you're sponsoring your own internal hackathon. Right. And we're going to bring the hoodies. And, and the beer and the pizza. And, and yeah. the beer and the pizza. Yeah, but you have the apparel and the technology plans. Right. <laughs> yes, you always order the t-shirts first. Uh, great. Um, so, uh, Steve, uh, high availability and resiliency um, has, uh, has come up a lot. Um, and I know OpenStack had a few challenges in that space, but in an area, uh, in that area, how have you approached that challenge for HPIT? Well, so there's always two sides of, of high availability. When you, when you talk to OpenStack people, it's always about the API. Is it a highly available API? And from an application perspective, we care less about the API. We're more <laughs> concerned about whether or not my application stays up, right? So um, <clears throat> it's, been, it's been interesting to, to go from a traditional IT mentality of I have a, a hypervisor and a, and a pet that stays up all the time, and one, one VM runs my application. Um, and I have to come up with you know, infrastructure solutions to keep that, uh, that application online versus the, the OpenStack way of ephemeral VMs and, and applications having to be stateless and having to, uh, to, to be able to, to tolerate failure. Um, and it's, you know, I think to, to the point that was made earlier, it's, it's very much, um, it, it's difficult for application developers, especially in an, in an old company, to make that shift from, mm -hmm. from traditional development to, to developing cloud applications. So HA, definitely there's, there's challenges in the in OpenStack and the infrastructure itself and the API layers, et cetera, but also just from the application perspective of how do I deploy an application on this type of infrastructure. Right, and Devin mentioned that they're doing a hackathon internally as one of the ways to educate. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things are you doing inside of HPIT to help you know, the organization be able to move in and make best use of this cloud? Yeah, and, and so we've, we've had internal hackathons as well. We've had a couple of them now. Um, we, have, we have groups, development groups within the organization that, that are much more forward-looking than others, and, and many of those are, are driving, um, driving a lot of that behavior. Daniel, who's sitting here in the second row, is uh, one of our, our application architects who drives a lot of that behavior as well. And uh, it's, it's a, lot of, um, a lot of evangelizing and, and trying to change behavior. Okay, great. Uh, Devin, you, uh, I know you, you're also working a lot at the PaaS level, layer level, um, and so what are the challenges in terms of uh, your existing applications and migrating them to, are you, are you looking to move to cloud native? Are you, are you taking your existing applications and migrating them over and help, having them scale better? How are you approaching your existing applications currently? So we're kind of just putting a stake in the sand, stand, uh, stake in the sand saying net new stuff, you need to be cloud ready. But for you know, our legacy applications, it's probably not worth it to actually go back and you know, get them to the point that they are cloud ready. Um, so they'll probably just remain on VMware-based infrastructure. OK, great. And Scott, I'll have the same question to you. I know you've got different uh, applications internally. Uh, and you're, you're, you're moving, you've got a couple big challenges of, of moving applications in. Talk a little bit about that. And, and similar to, uh, to Devin's question, which is, what's happening internally um, from your internal clients, what are they asking? Uh, so we'll do the first one first. The, uh, the, the approach we're taking, as Devin mentioned, is net new, should be cloud ready and able to run in a public or private or hybrid cloud, which means the application's resilient, the application is restful, it responds to certain m uh, metrics and monitoring and measurement endpoints, it's redeployable. The other thing we're starting to do, our hackathons haven't been around OpenStack, we've been doing container Docker hackathons. Mm -hmm. We're teaching the developers that if you don't embrace the cloud ready thing, at least embrace the container thing, and then orchestration can make your stuff cloud ready. Right? So if you can make your application stateless at start and inject state when you boot them, then we can restart them and stop them without telling you. And that one's a little harder to deal with because the developers don't like to debug in a container environment as well. So um, between the hackathons and a big stick, we're trying to encourage people in the right direction. Um, well, we're different, we're not doing this from the, we've got management direction that we need the agility and the reprovisioning based on unknown applications. Um, Devin mentioned earlier, I don't know what production or marketing is gonna do tomorrow, much less in a week or two. So if they say I need 100 VMs to run a website, it should really just be an API call and a few minutes worth of provisioning. And that's sort of the goal. 
Orlando, I'm going to um, pick on you first for this one, which is uh, you guys have been using OpenStack for a while now. Yes. Uh, so there's many people here who are either just getting started or looking to get started. Um, give me one of your best practices from what you've learned uh, with OpenStack as, as a solution provider in your case. Okay, so, so there is, if you want to become a service provider <clears throat> um, within your organization, so one of the best practices to do, I, I explained to you about the federation, but going to that part is you want to have, for example, for block and object storage, you want to have one platform to manage. You don't want to have two to manage. For networking, you want to make sure you, you just stick to one, to one, the one that comes with Neutron, whether it's DVR or not, and just keep it a standard organization. And as they were speaking about Docker container and applications, um, there will be um, the, the reason why you want to keep it as a federation and as stable and, and as simple as possible is because the public cloud providers that are out there, like the one we're building in the May 29, um, allow you to, rather than burst RAM and CPU and storage to the cloud, allow you to take new members to your federation. So if you're building your private cloud with the standards, there are open standards that everyone can use. You can actually go to a public cloud provider and get 20 nodes or 30 nodes or 40 nodes and have full control of, the, of what these nodes do rather than just getting CPU and storage without having any control. So if you have applications like David was saying or Scotty for your developer, you can actually decide the SLA you require rather than give it to a third party that may not perform for what you need. And we use these best practices because the video game companies we have they have 10,000 users one day, but the game becomes so popular they can have 2 million users. So even if you build a private cloud and you want to have these applications, if you don't build it with the best practices of allow you to connect to other public clouds and control them, you won't be able to scale a video game, for example. Because it's 2 million users that require low latency and performance. Um, it can be any application you have, but if you go to the public cloud per se, um, it may cost you a lot of money because you will have to pay for um, flavors and profile that cost you more money, 16 CPU and core, but if you actually have a federated, you can actually take control of those servers and make it like the way you want it to do, have four core or any flavor you have. So in terms of best practices, just keep it uh, as simple as you can and just stick to open stack as it is. Great, thanks. Scott, I'm going to ask you the same question uh, in terms of best practices, in terms of your uh, implementations, what you've learned uh, around OpenStack. Sure. Um, probably one of the big ones is that you can't hand whittle your OpenStack environment. So continuous integration, continuous deployment is key. Everything that runs in the cloud has to be provisionable and recreatable by your configuration management. You don't want to deploy a VM and then go log into it and run a bunch of updates and whittle some scripts because you'll never recreate that state. You want to make sure that stuff happens upstream, make sure that you can recreate. The other thing, if you haven't um, if you're not familiar with the concept of a chaos monkey, go Google it. <laughs> chaos monkey is something that Netflix introduced as a way to verify that their applications are resilient and that their ops team is paying attention. They randomly inject fault. Um, OpenStack randomly injects faults all by itself, so you may not need a lot of, <laughs> you may not need a lot of chaos monkey, but um, one of the things, we haven't, we haven't done it at scale yet, but the intent is as you're doing your CI CD processes and as your test cases are running, break stuff. Find out how those processes recover. Find out how your application recovers. See if your load balancing works. See if your IP failover works, all that kind of stuff. Because it will break in production, so you might as well break it and test it and fix it in um, dev and test. Great, thanks. Uh, Steve, you're going to go next. I know you break things because you <laughs> talk once in a while. Um, best practices from your standpoint? Um, so I would say definitely you know, keeping the environment as simple as possible. Um, you know, when to the, the, anything that you end up having to do to customize your environment makes it much more difficult to maintain. Um, if, you have, if you have integrations for, especially when you're trying to do enterprise integration and not just deploying something in a lab, um, it ends up being much more complex and, and doing, whether it's, whether it's directories or security you know, policies and processes, finding a way to, to do that outside of OpenStack so that when OpenStack changes, you can have, you can have your, your perimeter built around it with, with your integration services. Um, but but don't um, don't rely on things staying the same in OpenStack and don't and don't rely on um, you know being able to, to upgrade and, and keep up when you know when your infrastructure expects a certain set of capabilities. Okay, great, Devin. 
you also have been using it for a while. So what about <laughs> you? What would you give these folks here as a, a best practice that you've learned? Um, I would say lower level, learn Python, learn Python logging, <laughs> how to dig into it. <laughs> to be able to be able to get down in the in the in the weeds with the, with the Python itself. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Um, Folks out there, you can start thinking about your questions. I'm going to be able to take a few questions from um, you guys as well uh, for these uh, four guys. Uh, it's going to be called Stump the Customer. See what we, <laughs> see what we can do there. Um, I do have another question, though. Uh, Devin, you uh, are also working uh, with some Moonshot hardware. Is that yes. correct? Could you tell us a little bit about why that is valuable to you and, and, and how you plan to utilize that hardware? Um, Maybe cover what Moonshot is very quickly, too. So Moonshot is, you know, kind of effectively small little low power, <coughs> low power, low cooling requirement servers in a box, um, 45 nodes in a box, uh, effectively. So um, that's, uh, you know, we think it goes hand in hand with kind of cloud architecture where you have these horizontal scale out scenarios. Um, anything you can basically distribute, you can distribute across Moonshot. So regarding to Mooshot, one of the things that we have seen is uh, for GPU rendering, uh, it's just really good because you can use what you're able to do with a Xeon, uh, would cost a lot, like cost a lot of money and a lot of scalability. Uh, if you're running your cloud, uh, for example, with Moonshot, you will be able to get uh, better performance with the money you invest. So you can actually save a lot of money running your cloud for a specific application that requires a lot of processing. Um, in a, con in, a, in a very, like, in a very small U, for like four AU, to be able to run it. So all the video game companies that I do and transcoding company that I have, uh, they are running uh, that kind of hardware to, to, to do GPU rendering or any that require a lot of CPU because it's actually cheaper for them. So if you don't know about it and you're trying to run your cloud, just check what application you have. Uh, you'll be able to figure out that this will actually be cheaper than running what your traditional IT is doing. Great, thanks. Uh, Steve Duft with <coughs> HP. Um, you, uh, we, we, HP also runs a public cloud, um, but I'm asking you from your HP IT side of things, how do you view the value of a public cloud and how would you integrate it into your solutions? Do you guys look to use that as part of your, your solutions that you're building internally and, and how? Yeah, well, so I mean, we, we do use our own public cloud extensively today, right? We have a large number of uh, applications that, um, that run in that environment and that we, um, a couple of years ago, migrated out of, we'll say, other third-party um, cloud um, hosting environments. And as we move forward with, with, um, with Helion OpenStack, we're, we're not wanting to build an instance of it everywhere in the world where we want a presence. And so our, our intent is to, uh, is to run a, a hybrid solution between either between ourselves, uh, our internal core data centers, and, and the HP public cloud, or the HP enterprise services, virtual private cloud offerings, so that we can extend into those data centers, but and have the same consistent experience across all the different sets of infrastructure. Great, thank you. All right, uh, I was uh, walking in the halls and I overheard a comment that OpenStack doesn't work. Uh, and so, yeah, so uh, would you answer that, Scotty? Uh, it works. Okay. For, for, for certain values of work, right? It depends a lot on your workload, on your environment, on your skill level, where your applications are. But for us, someone I was talking earlier, one of the big drivers for OpenStack is a consistent set of APIs and a consistent tool set to do automation. My goal is to replace the human middleware component of provisioning, of installing a, a, an image of, of providing a host. I can cut out that whole human middleware server group interaction, I can hand my developers the pointy end of an API and they can spin up a machine and they can do their testing and they can tear it back down again. The, and I think it's an overused term, it was brought up again this morning, developer productivity, not having to wait to get your Cassandra cluster, even five minutes makes the developer think they're a lot more productive and therefore they will be. So self-serve, we've been using it for a couple years now as a self-serve developer platform. You can have as many cores, bytes, and network bits as you want up to some quota limit. Quotas are important, by the way. OpenStack quotas work. Um, we had originally started testing in the public cloud, but you get real bills when you're using the public cloud, and people don't like seeing hard money. They'd rather buy capital and see soft money. So it works. Um, we're moving pretty rapidly to our first production deployment later this year, so we trust it that much. Thanks. I s sprung that one on you. I wasn't here. All right, uh, I will open it up right now. Does anybody out here have a question? Uh, you can uh, direct it at any one of them or just to the panel itself. 
Is our microphone working? Sound person? If you don't mind going to the mic there, we have that working. So my question is to all of you. Uh, we are considering uh, uh, having an OpenStack proof of concept. Did you consider other distributions of OpenStack <coughs> and why did you decide for Helion? Was that for Orlando? Or any one of them? Any one of them. Uh, so the, the question is, uh, did you guys consider any other uh, distributions of OpenStack besides Helion? Yeah, I can take that. <laughs> <laughs> we did. So before there was a Helion, it was just a glint in Tim's eye. We, um, we actually tried doing it ourselves. You can download all the components. It's open source. Uh, I don't recommend that unless you're a masochist because what's missing in the community, OpenStack is a great collection of tools and an architecture for those tools to interact. It's a platform. There's no community installer or upgrade or maintenance or, or delivery. Mm -hmm. The reason you pick a, a provider, a distribution provider, is if you don't want to be in the business of installing and operating the underlying bits of OpenStack. Before Helion, we were a Nebula customer. It was an early way to get no labor OpenStack in my environment. It was early for the, for the entire marketplace, too. Nebula folded recently. Switching to Helion gives me some of that same thing. I get. Um, I think HP has seven or eight of the PTLs for OpenStack on staff. They're available. I get an engineering group that's unrivaled. I get access to people who can help me solve my OpenStack problems without having to invent that skill set in-house. Especially for a POC, investing in engineering skill set for a POC doesn't make sense. So you, you can rent that. Great. Devin, mm. you want to take that? Uh, yeah, I would say basically the same answer. Um, you know, looking, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, looking, looking, looking at, you know, running upstream OpenStack or anything like that, um, you know, if you look at, say, the Walmarts and stuff like that that didn't go with a distribution, you know, they have a massive amount of in-house talent to run the OpenStack. Um, we didn't necessarily want to do that. Great. So, so we actually did the due diligence of carefully analyzing uh, what service provide distributors uh, of OpenStack were available at the time. And we realized a lot of them were not ready. Well, op OpenStack itself at the time wasn't ready 24 months ago, for anybody that tried before. <laughs> so uh, at that time, we decided to go with a solid company that is a top contributor of the OpenStack community that we can speak with and make sure that um, whatever need we require, they can actually work with us to help us get what we need to get. So that's one of the reasons why we decided to go with um, HP, Healy, and OpenStack. And Steve, did you want to address this question at all? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I will say that um, with our initial um, work with OpenStack two, three years ago, whenever it was, um, we, we did look at deploying from, um, you know, from, from code initially um, straight on an Ubuntu or Red Hat platform. Um, and that's when we made the decision for our object store to go with SwiftStack because they provided that end-to-end that, that -end management um, solution for specifically for Swift. Um, now, it would be a little bit difficult for me to, to decide to go to, with, with any other um, solution other than Helion, but, but I do have access to you know, an incredible organization of, of engineering and, and product folks that can, um, that can get things done that I need done. And, I and have, you've, you've I driven have, things internally, too, <laughs> as, as some of our other customers have, uh, yeah. getting feedback back in. So. And I have their home addresses. And <laughs> <laughs> Great. Anyone else would like to ask a question? The, the mic right there would be great. And try to speak a little bit loud. That mic's a little soft. Um, I would, this question is to all of you. Would like to know what sort of storage you are uh, using and what sort of thing, any tips or any problem that you face uh, when deploying storage in the, at a cloud scale? OK, so the question is around storage, yep. what you currently mm -hmm. use, and what kinds of issues you might have run into with that. In general or under OpenStack? Okay, so under OpenStack, since it's Helion, we're using the VSA um, product, the Virtual Storage Appliance product that HP provisions on ProLiant hardware, which is the default Cinder and Glant storage, uh, local disk for ephemeral storage, and we're using um, SL4500s full of disks for Swift. And then in success, which will be in a couple of months, right, Desmond? We're going to be, we'll probably <laughs> move the, um, the Cinder and Glant storage to 3PAR, so we have that available in the, in the environment. Devin, you want to tackle that one for you? Uh, yeah, we're, we're running actually VSA on top of the SL4540s as well. Um, and Swift on the SL4540s, uh, we're also looking at uh, PO Sync uh, Ceph at some point, also on the SL4540s. So you're looking at Ceph as well as Swift at this point? Yeah. Okay. So we actually have, you, it depends on your application. So I, I'm going to answer what, why we choose the one that we chose. but. 
I can give you some advice. If you, if you have object storage, for example, that you want to have multi-data center, uh, then you have only one choice, right? So you have to go with Swift because it's the only one that is there right now. But if you want to have blog storage and object storage and you want to be able to have it decentralized, uh, then you can go with Ceph. Now, uh, you can go with preparatorship uh, storage solution, but that, they're very expensive. So uh, just to give an example, what we are able to accomplish with Ceph, uh, we're able to get one gigabyte throughput uh, with SAS disk. So um, if you want to do the same with the preparatorship uh, solution, it will cost you a fortune. You have to use SSD and probably have multiple tier, but you can create the same with Ceph and be able to do it. So uh, of course, you're going to have limitations, as I say, of how much you can put into a Ceph. That's why you need to use the federation. And if you use, I keep saying, if you use that federation, you, the, one, the one good thing that you can use, if you don't use that storage, uh, the way I see the future is you will be able to resell that storage after 7 p.m. when your company doesn't use it or when your peaks, you will be able to sell it to, for example, the future of the Helium network. Uh, one of the things, yeah. Hope that to clarify the, the question. Great. Steve Duff with HPIT. Yeah. Well, and so we are right now for block storage, we are using the, the store virtual VSA. Um, and, we're, and we're doing that largely so that we could deploy on, on what we call commodity hardware, right, which is the DL380s. Um, and that gives us the ability to, to run, again, traditional hardware, everything over IP, being able to, to scale the block storage on, on, on that traditional hardware. As we go forward, we might end up converting to 3PAR. Um, we are a big fiber channel shop, enterprise IT, and um, you know we're interested in looking at the opportunities with all flash dedupe and, and some of the other features of, of that platform to see what kind of benefits we could get there as well. Okay. Great, thank you for your question. Anyone else? Just say it loud and I'll repeat it. Okay, so. So let me know if I get this right. But the, the thing is, we talked about scale. Yes. And uh, Orlando, you specifically stated, you know, if you federated across multiple clouds, we can get that scale without having to go over 100 nodes. The question is really, is that, are we in a transition state on that? Isn't OpenStack supposed to be able to handle massively sized clouds? And, uh, there are challenges with federated clouds, yeah. just as there are challenges with large-scale clouds. So. so, yeah, so to answer that question, so, of course, there's a lot of challenges, but that's opportunity for people in the community to help you solve those challenges. So, uh, we spent 24 months, uh, one of those 24 months, we had to spend three, four months just to fix billing, because, you know, when you have a federated, but we're a service provider, so if you're a user, um, it would be probably your billing to your customer will be easier as if you are a service provider because we have multiple users and we need to allow them to build the internal organization. So uh, is federation a transition? The way I see it with the information that I have, I don't see it as a transition, I see it as a fact. Uh, that's what I repeated so many times. And the reason why I see that is because um, this is a community that is trying to create a better product. And there will be innovation every six months. And if you start modifying the code, it's just not going to work for you. You won't be able to, as they say, you won't be able to release the package. You won't be able to, to do it. You have to, the only way to grow it is a federated and probably um, providers are actually going to allow you to connect to that public resources and, and have your own infrastructure running on there. Well, it will be their physical equipment, but you will be able to run it like if it was in your private cloud. So you don't have problem or orchestration in your private cloud and in your public cloud and which you have a, a bottleneck because you cannot scale your private cloud except buying more physical servers. Okay, and I'll answer from HP's perspective in that um, we continue in every release to push the, the limits on uh, scale. And so yes, our goal is to go well beyond 100 uh, physical nodes in the clouds. Uh, but in terms of creating a stable, enterprise-grade, supportable product, we're kind of where we are today. So I do see it more as transitional. Uh, we'll break those barriers, but you'll run into new issues once you do that. So once you're at 1,000 nodes or 2,000 nodes or 5,000 nodes, you, you probably have some networking issues to, to challenge there too. So when you look at the whole of OpenStack, um, that's kind of where HP approaches it uh, in terms of the distributions we're creating. Yes. Actually, I have another question for you. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
heterogeneous infrastructure. Now, all of you guys use HP storage. Why does HP Helium does not support other storage in these days? Uh, I thought, yeah, sorry, I, I may maybe didn't explain that properly. We, we use Ceph. We don't use any yeah, HP storage. No Let's say enterprise shop not using Ceph, not using HP storage, not using Tripa, using Hitachi, and then whatever. Our response is not supported. Yeah, so the, the question was that uh, in Paris, uh, HP got up and talked about how we uh, pro provide choice, choice in, in hardware, choice in drivers, choice in um, how, you, how you choose to put it together. And uh, the question was, you know, how come everyone's using uh, HP hardware and HP storage? Um, it, it's a good question. Uh, HP is actually building programs to allow uh, certification of that additional hardware. Uh, those are being put in place now. Code Code and yeah. see a demo of, of exactly what you're asking for. So that opens tonight at, at 6 o'clock or 6.10. Yeah, and, and we, we will continue to add uh, additional hardware. So, yeah, in the booth we have a bunch of Dell stuff in the rack and some other non-HP hardware. Yeah, uh, IBM. Dell and IBM. Yeah. So, so the short answer is at HP we do want to offer that choice. Um, we are building a certification program so that we can work with those hardware vendors so that they can actually certify their hardware, get the little stamp of approval that it's certified, uh, running the scripts and the tests to make sure that it, uh, it's, it's supportable. So we are moving in that direction. And I would say stop by the booth and, and ask them specifically on, on anyone that, any specific hardware you're working with. I've actually done a little work with Hitachi as well, so we're working with them to certify some of their stuff now. Okay? Um, am I out of time? Yep. All right. Sorry I'm out of time. Uh, these guys will stay up here for a little bit if you have a quick question to come on up. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, and please fill out the cards and drop them in the back. Thank you.